Okay, so I, I want to talk to you this morning about uh, Armageddon. And uh, uh, when we talk about Armageddon, the, the Bible uh, talks, talks about a war that happens in the end time. And it's, it's like there's several aspects of it. Armageddon, uh, we think of as the point when Jesus comes back uh, and uh, reveals himself to mankind. But uh, there's, there's a couple of battles that are going on uh, that sort of are incorporated in that Armageddon. So I just want to have a look uh, at, at what, what I uh, believe is um, the, the sequence of events in that area that we refer to as Armageddon. Uh, so we'll see um, what, what we can discover. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence. Lord, we just pray that you would have your way in this place, Lord. We are so grateful because you, ha you are the victor. And Lord, you already wear the victor's crown. It's not the things that uh, are coming on this world. It's not a question of who's going to win and who's going to lose. Lord, you are the mighty God. There is no one in comparison to you. And Lord, uh, you, you uh, uh, have created this world. It belongs to you. And Lord, your desire is that men would serve you and worship you. Lord, uh, unfortunately, we as human beings, we've decided to uh, satisfy ourselves. And Lord, we do not take you into uh, the equation so often. And Lord, uh, your word tells us there's a consequence to what is sin. And sin is a disregard for the laws of God. Lord, we understand there's coming a day when you're going to say enough is enough. But Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we can know you as our saviour. Lord, as the one who watches over and keeps us. Lord, you're our healer. You're our present help. And Lord, uh, you want people to surrender their lives to you today. And Lord, if we'll do that, Lord, the consequences that are coming on this earth uh, don't have a part in our lives. But Lord, you want us to understand uh, this plan. You want us to understand that you can declare the things that have, have not yet uh, happened uh, before they occur to show that you are God. And Lord, as a warning that we would be ready. And Lord, we just pray that you'd speak to our hearts this morning as we look at this subject. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to uh, begin with Revelation chapter 16, verses 13 to 16. You can read it from your notes if you want to. Lolita. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Okay, now we're, we're taking scriptures uh, and, um, and I've tried to give you, uh, I'm trying to get it sort of in context, but to read these scriptures, you ought to begin at the chapter before or beginning of chapters. Um, don't, don't just start halfway through a chapter, but we're, we're trying to give you, I'm trying to give you in, in um, uh, I'm trying to let you see what it's talking about, but the way to read the Bible is to read it in context. Uh, Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 19. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horse clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. 
And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Amen. Overhead, please. Okay, so the battle of Armageddon is really, um, uh, in some ways, a, a war or a ca campaign. It's not, uh, it's not just when Jesus appears. Uh, so the battle of Armageddon is the climactic war after which Jesus Christ will establish himself as supreme ruler of the earth. The stone that was miraculously cut out of the mountain is going to consume the whole world. Now Armageddon as a place, Armageddon is situated on the southern tip of the plain of Ezraldon. It's out, out um, west of, of Jerusalem basically, the place of Armageddon. But Armageddon uh, is also, uh, well Armageddon, the very sound of the word causes a shiver to run up and down our spines. When we talk about Armageddon, it implies the end. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's a word that brings fear. You know, people, people will say, um, use the term Armageddon and it's talking about the worst. Uh, but for us as Christians, Armageddon is when Jesus returns. Uh, Armageddon takes, I'll, I'll look at it later, but Armageddon, when they talk Armageddon, it's talking about a bigger area than just the place uh, in the Valley of Megiddo. There can be no successful coexistence of good and evil. You can't have good and evil dwelling together. That's what's trying to happen in this world, but it never works. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 tells us, Your glorying, glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? And so therefore this world has got some, uh, some putrefaction in it, and it's putrefying the whole thing. And the church, when we come to the Lord, uh, He cleans us up as individuals and He wants us to walk uh, uh, holy before Him, uh, pure before Him. But unfortunately, we've still got that old nature that rises up. Uh, so we need to yield ourselves to the Spirit every day. Yield to the Spirit, not to the flesh that wants to drag us back into the old position that we're in. But for this world, there is, they, they don't have the Holy Ghost, so they're just becoming more and more corrupt. Whatever evil is resident in the earth will contaminate all it takes control. Evil contaminates the heart like a cancer. While the population of the earth was only three, one of them was a reject. Genesis chapter 4, verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any fighting him should kill him. So he was, you know, Adam and Eve and Cain, and Cain's a reject. From the first act of violence when Cain slew Abel to the latest crime, it is evident to all what sin has cost humanity. This day and age, you know, Adam and Eve take of a piece of fruit and it caused a catastrophe that is being felt today and the sin of mankind today is, is it's a monster. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's caused this whole world to stagger. The corruption that is in the world affects every single one of us. Next overhead, please. Good and evil must meet head on and make war. It's inevitable because it's God versus Satan. It's 
good versus evil. And there will be a showdown. As the showdown comes into focus, it is apparent that the world will be filled with people marked by a system that represents evil and are locked into a confrontation with the one who is altogether good. Now, they're not planning that at this stage, but that's what's going to happen. Uh, when, when, uh, when, the, when, they are, when things are absolutely falling to pieces and God comes on the scene, they actually think they can fight God and win. Next overhead, please. Okay. The Gentile world is divided into four geographical divisions with Jerusalem being the center in the Word of God I'm talking about. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 5 verse 5, Thus saith the Lord God, This is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. And so we've got the Western uh, alliance, if I can put it like that, which is uh, the, uh, the reinvigorated Roman Empire. And uh, that represents supposedly Christendom. You have the Russian alliance. It talks about the Northern alliance, uh, the Russian alliance, and that's the atheists. Uh, you've got the Southern alliance, uh, the, the Arabs, uh, mainly Muslim. And you've got the Eastern alliance, the Oriental Ar Ar alliance, which is the Buddhist alliance. And, uh, and I'm sure the Hindus fit in there somewhere. All, all the religions or non-religion of the world is going to come uh, against God in one place. And that place is Armageddon. Okay, next. Overhead, please. Okay, now, um, this is my drawing. Uh, and maybe, maybe I could color Africa in, you know, green. Uh, but according to the scriptures, I, I've tried to uh, show the Northern Confederacy, the Southern Confederacy, uh, the Eastern Confederacy and the Western Confederacy uh, on the map. Uh, um, on this map, uh, North America and South America are over here somewhere. Uh, but um, America doesn't get a mention, to me, America doesn't get a mention in prophecy. If they're, if they're uh, represented there, they are in the Western Alliance, the, the, the Christian Alliance, if I can put it like that, the Reformed Roman Empire. So, first of all, I want to talk about the Northern Confederacy. And I've given you a whole lot of scriptures there. Uh, Ezekiel 38, Daniel 11, Joel 2. Uh, I've given you seven, several scriptures uh, pertaining to this Northern Confederacy. And I've given you, for example, uh, Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 1 to 6. A little later, if you'd like to read that. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying... Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company, with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togama of the north quarters and all his bands, and many people with thee. Thank you. Um, we used to sing a song that was, uh, was about marching around the walls or something, or marching on the walls and... Uh, it was very victorious. In actual fact, uh, that song came from talking about Gog de defeating Jerusalem or uh, coming against Jerusalem. They didn't defeat Jerusalem, but uh, coming against Jerusalem. I remember in the church, we'd sing that song and get so excited. And I used to think, why, why would we do that? But um, Gog, some uh, translations say Rosh, is the leader of the, in the land of Magog and represents Russia and their satellites. The area from the Black Sea to the Baltic Sea to the Ural Mountains. Uh, Meshek is part of Turkey and Tubal is also part of Turkey. Uh, their allies are Persia, that's Iran, 
Ethiopia, also referred to as Kush, uh, North and South Sudan. It's not necessarily Ethiopia per se. Uh, Put is Libya and possibly beyond, Goma, part of Turkey, and uh, Togoma, part of Turkey. Syria is also part of this alliance. Now, interestingly enough, um, I, I, I find it very interesting that Russia, Iran, Syria uh, are an alliance, and in actual fact, the Bible implies that they're going to be an alliance. And Turkey is poking their nose in there at the moment, and uh, and uh, it doesn't mean that this is the Armageddon or the attack from the north that the Lord is speaking about in the Word of God, but it's ready. They're all set up. They're, there's an alliance there. Uh, they hate Israel, and uh, they're fighting, you know, issues within themselves, but ultimately uh, they are geared up and they could turn their, their sights on Israel at any time. And certainly Russia uh, has been and always will be an, an enemy of Israel. Uh, the Eastern Coalition, Revelation chapter 16, verse 12, and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So the Euphrates dries up, uh, um, uh, and um, the, the Asian nations can come across and come into Israel. People beyond the Euphrates, the Chinese, uh, China will possibly ally, uh, will have, possibly have Asian allies, but it's opening the door for China and, and, and Asian. Uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 says, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him, like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships and he will enter into the countries and he shall overflow and pass over. So the northern confederacy is going to come down and the southern confederacy is going to be pushing up against uh, Israel. And certainly um, that's highly likely. It's, I've, I say the Arabs, uh, it's likely to be Egypt. Egypt um, Egypt has been opposed to Israel over the centuries, although they've gone very quiet since the last war uh, and uh, Israel almost occupied Cairo. Uh, they've gone quiet, but, but uh, they could rise up, or at least it can be the Arab, can, uh, Arab nations. The Western Confederacy, a European confederacy under the leadership of the Antichrist, some form of loosely defined Roman Empire. That's the Western Confederacy. Next overhead, please. Okay. So the final campaign, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, east of Jerusalem. East, east of Jerusalem. That, that side of Jerusalem. So, um, Joel chapter 3, verse 12. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Another scripture implies from Edom, Isaiah 63 and 1. Who is this that cometh forth from Edom uh, with dyed garments from Bosra? This is that, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. So it's talking about Edom, from Edom. Uh, Jerusalem, uh, verse, Zechariah 14, verse 2, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the house rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of people shall not be cut off from the city. So that uh, it's talking about uh, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, it's talking about Edom, it's talking about Jerusalem, and uh, Ezekiel 38, 9 and 16 talks about uh, covering the whole land. Ezekiel 38, 9, Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm, thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee, 
and verse 16, And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. So uh, Armageddon, understanding it's more than one war, it's, it's a war with uh, uh, Russia, it's, uh, it's um, uh, the Antichrist, uh, the nations coming against the Antichrist, but certainly it's implying it's the Valley of Jehoshaphat, it's from Edom, it's Jerusalem, it's covering the land, uh, and uh, uh, it's something like 320 kilometers or 200 miles, the total length of Israel. Revelation chapter 14, verse 20 says, And the winepress was trodden without the city, and the bl blood came out of the winepress, even up to the horse's bridle, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. It's a long distance. So Armageddon isn't just a spot. It's talking about the land of Israel and the blood will flow, basically the length of Israel. So the first invasion, Daniel 11 verse 40, and at that time, at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. So, the southern kingdom will rise up against Israel as will the northern kingdom because they see it as an easy prey. Ezekiel chapter 38 verses 11 to 13. Thanks. Ezekiel 38, 11 to 13. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba and Dadan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey? To carry away silver and gold to take away cattle and goods to take a great spoil Okay, so uh, this is telling us that Egypt or the Arab nations from the south um, and uh, uh, Russia are going to look at Israel and say you know, she's a sitting duck. There's a lot of value there. We'll take her. It's, it's an easy thing to do. But, but God will intervene and God will hinder that from happening. Next overhead, please. Okay, next one. Sorry. Okay, so they are coming in accordance with God's plan. Joel 2, 11, And the Lord shall utter His voice before His army, for His camp is very great, for He is strong that executeth His word. For the day of the Lord is great and very ter terrible. Who can abide it? So He's going to tell them, off you go, boys, and they're going to come and try and attack Israel. Uh, and they will cause... Um, a catastrophe in Israel. They will be victorious as two thirds of the Jews will die and the other third will flee into the wilderness. Zechariah 13, 8. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die and the third shall be left therein. Revelation 12 and 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's three and a half years, basically. And God will come against these attackers uh, in Ezekiel 20 to 23. You can read that. Thanks. Ezekiel 38, 20 to 23. So that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall 
and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. And I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord. Amen. So uh, with this attack from the north and the south, God will bring an end to it. Through this great victory, God's people will recognize him as the Almighty, as will the nations. Now this is not the same event as Revelation 28, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, uh, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Uh, Revelation 28 is at the end of the thousand years of peace. It's not the same event. There's a, a number of reasons why the invasion of Gog is not the same as the Battle of Armageddon. One, in the Battle of Gog, definite armies are mentioned, while at Armageddon, all nations are engaged. Two, God, Gog comes from the north, while at Armageddon, the, the armies come from the whole earth. Three, Gog comes to take spoil, while at Armageddon, the nations assemble to destroy the people of God. Four, there is protest at Gog's invasion, but at Armageddon there is no protest because all nations are joined against Jerusalem. Five, Gog is the head of the armies in this invasion, but at Armageddon the beast is the head of the invasion. Six, God is over, Gog is overthrown by the powers of nature, but the armies of Armageddon are destroyed by the, uh, by the word that goes out of Christ's mouth. Seven, Gog's armies are arrayed in an open field, while at Armageddon they are seen in Jerusalem. Eight, the Lord calls for assistance in executing judgment on Gog, while at Armageddon he is viewed as treading the winepress alone. So there are two diverse battles. Next overhead, please. Sis. Okay, the second invasion. Really, the second invasion, the Western Alliance, the beast who made a covenant with Israel to secure her peace, initially comes to her, comes to her aid, but then breaks the covenant and moves into Jerusalem. Daniel chapter 11, verses 41 to 45, please. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand. This even is the Edom, Antichrist that we're speaking of. And Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Okay, so as he spreads his power, the Antichrist spreads his power, base there will be other uprisings from the north and east. Jerusalem is now called Sodom and Egypt because sin reigns there. He set up his headquarters there. Revelation 11, 8. And their de dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where, our all, where also our Lord was crucified. That's Jerusalem. Okay, the river Euphrates, Euphrates dries up and the kings of the east come against the Antichrist. Revelation 16, 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial against the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, and the way of the kings of the east might, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And, as I mentioned last week, uh, I, I believe that the Harlot Church has been destroyed by the Antichrist at this stage. And uh, because of the economic crisis, uh, these countries are all coming against the Antichrist. Next overhead, please. So 
So they're coming, they're upset with the Antichrist, uh, but Jesus appears uh, in heaven and they decide that they're going to uh, fix Jesus first and they'll deal with the consequences. Uh, I think they've watched too many movies. I, I think there's those kind of movies around today. The world can win against anything. Now, interestingly enough, uh, Rev, uh, Armageddon occurs between uh, Revelation 19 uh, verses 19 and 20. Lolita, can I get you to read Revelation chapter 19 verses 17 to 21? Please. Revelation 19, 17 to 21. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Okay, so they're there. They're ready to make war against God. Keep going, please. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Okay, so between verses 19 and 20, 19 is them ready, 20, the battle is over. So Armageddon, you know, we can talk about Armageddon, but the Bible, it fits between two verses. It's, it, the battle is not explained. But I really think that uh, when, when Jesus appears, he's likely to say something simply like drop dead. And that's it. It's through the, through the word, through his word, the sword that comes out of his mouth, through his word, he gives a command and it happens. Now, I understand some people teach that, you know, it's a nuclear explosion, for example. Uh, God can do what he wants, but he doesn't, need, uh, uh, he doesn't need America, for example, to drop a few nuclear bombs to bring Arm Armageddon. Uh, he, can, he can, I don't know. He's, with his fingers, he can split atoms. He doesn't need mankind. If he wants to use the, an atomic explosion, he can do it. But I think it's just the word of his mouth. We don't need more than that. When God says something, it happens. And so we don't, we don't need to play around with these things. It's, that's just the way it is. As the nations gather against Jerusalem, Christ will bring a halt towards. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 3 and 4. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there sh shall be a very great valley and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Next overhead, please. Okay, so I've put there, it is important to recognize that the second coming of Jesus Christ will occur in two advents. We believe Jesus is coming for the church uh, at the rapture, the snatching away of the church. And then he's coming to the Mount of Olives when he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives uh, uh, to say enough is enough. Next overhead, please. Okay, the conquering Christ. No matter how great the opposition, Jesus Christ will triumph over evil forces. Everything is going according to schedule. Our faith and confidence in Jesus is not misplaced. It's going to happen. The harvest is ripe and Jesus applies the sickle. He treads the winepress alone as he destroys the enemy with the word of his mouth. And uh, I, I just, I want to remind you, when he's treading the wine press of the wrath of God, he, it is not something that he is enjoying. Uh, he is not willing that any should perish. 
And therefore, when he brings judgment on this world, he is not smiling. He doesn't think it's wonderful. He's paid the price that every man, every woman can be saved, but they have not availed themselves of it. And he has to say enough is enough. So a day has to come when he says, this is not the way it ought to be. And the Bible tells us if he didn't come, everyone would be annihilated. He is not enjoying it. He's doing it by himself. He is judging alone, but he's not, it's not, this is not a fun time for God. God robed himself in flesh and died on Calvary that we can escape. And yet we as human beings ignore his offer and go our own way and bring absolute destruction. And he has to say no more. There were some 60, this almost blows my mind. There were some 60 to 80 million casualties during World War II. 60 to 80 million casualties. That's about 3% of the world's population. Yet nowhere was there formed a river of blood as described in Revelation 14, 20, which we've read. And the winepress was trodden without the city. The blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse's bridles by the space of 1,600 furlongs. So up to the horse's bridle for a distance of some 200 miles, the blood is flowing. It's going to be, it's going to be a massive catastrophe. And interesting enough, men are coming to, against God with primitive weapons. Uh, we, I believe we read it earlier. But they're going to uh, turn their plowshares plash into swords. And I think by the time they've, the devastations that are happening to this world, you're not going to have uh, fighter planes flying and you're going to have uh, basic things. They're going to come against God with nothing and they're going to lose. Okay, next overhead, please. So that, that green area is the area of, uh, of Armageddon, to describe the 200 miles. Um, that that um, Megiddo, Armageddon, is that, that bit that's up the top there. That's Megiddo, the valley of Megiddo. But it's certainly covering the, the whole area right down to Edom. So they come against God, but they will be consumed at his coming as prophesied by, uh, by Enoch, the righteous man of God. Jude chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now that's before the flood. Enoch was before the flood and he was prophesying the day that is yet to come. Zechariah 14 and 12. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet and their eyes shall consume away in their holes and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. Ezekiel chapter 39 verse 26 says, After they have borne their shame and all their trespasses, whereby they have trespassed against me when they dwelt safely in their land and none made them afraid. But the day is coming. Joel 2, 12 and 13 and, and verse 18. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Verse 18, then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. He, he, he wants to extend mercy, but the world doesn't want it. But ultimately, uh, at Armageddon, when he comes and he says enough is enough, 
his people, Israel, are going to decide we're going to serve him. We're going to allow him to be our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. Next overhead, please. Not all people will be destroyed, but had Christ not come at that time, they would have been. If you want to avoid the judgment of God, turn to him today, for today is the day of salvation. In fact, today is a good day because we don't, if, you, if you come to him, repent of your sins, baptize in Jesus' name to wash away your sins, receive the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues, you, you've made a decision that will get you, I'm heavy, but the Holy Ghost will lift me off of this place and get me into heaven and these things will bypass us. The choice is ours and today's a good day to choose Jesus Christ. Let's stand.